very good morning to all of us. Shall we pray the prayer for elimination uh, together? Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning, our scripture lesson is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and, was, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, uh, good morning once again, church. All right. Uh, it's a wonderful morning, as Pastor Danny has said. Nice and cooling. Okay, so take out your sermon notes, stay awake, and let's prepare to hear God's word. Uh, before that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord, this morning, once again, we ask for your spirit to come and fill our midst, Lord. As we continue in our, to, to talk about relationships, Lord, we pray, Father God, you continue to open our hearts to the relationships around us. Not just the broken relationships, but the existing relationships to make them better, to heal broken relationships and to make better existing relationships, Lord. Lord, we just commit each and every one of us here unto your hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are continuing in our second part of our, uh, the second uh, number two of the series on uh, relationship killers. For the benefit of those of you who are just joining us, you know, we are going through a series where we're going to talk, look at things in our lives, habits, characters, attitudes in our life that are detrimental to relationships, that will kill a relationship. And today, yeah, last week, we, we, uh, the, the week before, we talked about anger as a relationship killer. The second relationship killer we're going to talk about today is dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction or discontentment. You see, friends, nothing kills relationship like being dissatisfied. When we are dissatisfied in a relationship, we are dissatis you're not satisfied with the way the relationship is going. You're not satisfied with the way your relationship is with one another. You're not satisfied with your uh, encounters with one another. And you, if, uh, 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 you're not satisfied with your husband. Or husbands, you're not satisfied with your wife because maybe she doesn't cook well enough for you. Or husband or, you, or wives, you're not satisfied with your husband because she does, he does not buy enough flowers for you. Or children, you're dissatisfied with your children because they take up too much of your time and they drive you up the wall too often. And when you, there's many dissatisfied 
satisfaction in your life or discontentment in your life, sooner or later, friends, mark my words, sooner or later, it will suck the life out of your relationships. It will suck the life out of a relationship. And not just dissatisfaction with one another. Even in any areas of our lives, if we allow this satisfaction or this contentment to breed in our hearts, it will affect our relationship as well. If you're dissatisfied at work, every day you go to the office, you sit down and you work, you look at your boss, you're dissatisfied, you look at your colleague, you're dissatisfied. When you come home, that dissatisfaction comes home with you. That discontentment comes home with you and it affects your life at home. When you come to church and you're not satisfied about the church, you're not satisfied with the people you see, you're not satisfied with the service, you're not satisfied with your, your spiritual growth, and when you go home after church, you bring that dissatisfaction into your relationships. If you go home every day and you see your house and you're not satisfied with your house because maybe the, the rooms are not big enough, the windows are not big enough, the kitchen is not big enough, the, the ceiling is not tall enough, whatever the reason, and you are dissatisfied. Every time you look at your home and you are dissatisfied, you will be dissatisfied with everybody living in the home as well, friends. And so dissatisfaction will affect every corner of your life. Let's be honest. When you're happy... Relationships are better. Isn't that true? When you're happy, relationships, even the, 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 the most difficult relationships, seems quite okay. But when you are unhappy, when you're dissatisfied, when you're discontented, that exact same relationships feels dry. It feels life-draining. It feels tired just to be around those people because dissatisfaction drains us. And we don't realize how bad it is. We don't realize how detrimental dissatisfaction really is. And we allow it to breed in our lives. We allow it to enter our lives and we don't realize that that is the devil's tactic to make us unhappy. That's the devil's way to get at us. And we don't realize it and we just fall into the trap. And that's the oldest trick in the book. And it, it all started in the Garden of Eden when things were perfect when things were wonderful, when things were as good as it can get. Yet, the devil knows that in order to get Eve to eat the fruit, in order to get Eve to sin, he has to start with dissatisfaction. Read Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. What was the serpent doing? The serpent was very, very cunning. He, cunning basically means what I say, I don't mean. I say something, but I got another meaning, I got another agenda behind it. So, what my words are is meant to twist and start. there's some other hidden meaning. If you look at the serpent's words, he asked Eve, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? It's just a question. It's an innocent question. But the devil knows. Because what he's doing is, he's drawing Eve's attention to that one tree that she cannot eat. You know, by the way, uh, in the Garden of Eden, there are more than two trees, you know. The Bible tells us God planted trees. Sometimes we only think uh, there's the tree of life and tree of good and evil. So every day they sit there and they look, tree of life, tree of good and evil, I take this, cannot take that. That's not how it is, okay? And if I, I don't know, this is a guess, lah, all right? But when God created the Garden of Eden, He brought all species of animal for Adam to, to name, correct? Every single species. So my best guess is, He also placed every single species of trees, of fruit-bearing trees, in the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine how many trees are there? Horticulturists, People who study trees, in case you don't know what those, those are, people who plant and cultivate, they estimate there's about 2,500 types of fruit-bearing trees in the world today. 2,500 types of fruit-bearing trees. And I believe each and every one of them, at least, was in the Garden of Eden. And so Eve is standing here with 2,500 trees of delicious fruits 
Durians. Okay, I don't like durians, but I know you all love durians. So durians. Mangoes. Mangosteen. What else? Plums. Pomegranates. You know, all sorts of fruits. Thousands and thousands. 2,500. And if Eve continue with that, she'll not be discontented. She'll be happy. There's no way to get her to sin. And so what the devil does? Psst, Eve. Look at that one tree that you cannot have. Forget about the 200 and 400, the 2,499 that you can have. Let's talk about that one tree that you cannot have. And despite all that she had, when Eve began to focus her attention on that one that she could not have, despite of the 2,499 that she could have, when she focused on that one, that's when the devil got her. It starts there. In fact, would you write to me, the first point of your notes is this, that this satisfaction ripens our hearts to sin. It ripens our hearts. Because when the devil gets us to focus on the things that dissatisfies us, he got you. He got us. Because it ripens our hearts. It makes our hearts ready. It, it steers our hearts. It encourages our hearts. It, 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 it entices our hearts to be ready to sin. Because this satisfaction will always lead to jealousy. If you go home every day and you're dissatisfied, you look at your, I don't know, you look at your car and you're dissatisfied with your car. Why your car can, can only, uh, when you, every time you turn on the engine, black smoke come out, and so you're dissatisfied with it. And when you become dissatisfied with what you have, and you begin to look at your neighbour and you say, hey, my neighbour is driving a Mercedes, you begin to build jealousy. You're going to build covetousness. I want that. I'm jealous. I want that. And it opens the door to temptation. Yes, whatever I can do, I will get it. If I, can, if I have to cheat in my company, if I have to work hard, if I have to neglect my family, whatever I do, I will get it. Isn't that true? It happens to every area of our lives. You know, you can have everything that is going well. You can have, if you're not dissatisfied, there's no room for temptation. But if you're looking, you can have everything that's very well at home. But if you're looking at one area that is dissatisfying, and you allow that dissatisfaction to build, it will lead to jealousy and it will lead to sin. Husbands, come home. You have a wife that is just so loving, who cares for you, who takes care of the children, who cooks for you, cleans for you, who not only that, but emotionally helps you, who's always supportive of you, who always encourages you, whoever speaks words that edifies you. And, and you love her. It's just so wonderful. But then one day you were walking with her and then you realise, you, you look around and you, and you notice television, TV screens, all the ladies there come in hourglass shape. And you go home and you look at your wife how come she looks more like a pear than an hourglass? And dissatisfaction begins to build. And then lo and behold, when you go to office the next day, and there was a new employee, a new staff comes in, and it's a pretty little thing with an hourglass shape. And temptation begins to build. Because you focus on that one tree that you can't have. When you forget about the 200 and 2,499 trees that you can enjoy. And the devil knows. You know there's a study being conducted to test the happiness of people. They want to do a study and say, they want to know how happy people are. So what affects people's happiness? So in Denmark, they took 1,000 people and they did a test. They divided them into two groups. The first group, they, both of them will do a happiness test. They will ask all sorts of questions and they will rate their level of happiness. Then they send the two groups out. Okay, for the next one week, you are all not one group, continue your life as normal. Okay, they are, these are all Facebook users. So they say one group continue. You use Facebook tr 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 three hours a day, go ahead. Half an hour a day, one hour a day, continue your life. The other group, you're not allowed to touch Facebook for one whole week cannot log in, cannot even check, nothing. No notification, nothing. At the end of one week, they gathered back the participants and they did the happiness test all over again. Those 
who went back and were, were doing Facebook for the whole week, came back, no difference. Their happiness level was still the same. But those, surprisingly, those who went back and abstained from Facebook for a whole week, when they came back, the studies found that they were much more happier. That there was a marked improvement in happiness and life satisfaction among those who are not using Facebook for one week. Why? What happened? Okay, I'm not against Facebook, but the study then continues to say, you know why? Because when we go on Facebook, very often, okay, let's be honest, huh? people only post the best things about their life on Facebook, right? Did you post the time when you got scolded? Or the time when you got fired from your job? Or when the time the boss or did something? We post our best, our prime of our life. The best holidays, the best picture. Even though the holiday is not so good, we'll make sure the picture is in such an angle that the holiday looks very good. Isn't that true? And we'll post that on Facebook. And everybody looking on Facebook, they see, Ayo, my friend is enjoying this. Ayo, she's enjoying that. Ayo, she's gone to, to Europe for holiday. And me, I only go to St. John's Hill for holiday. Ayo. I look at them, wow, they're eating the latest steakhouse. They've gone to Tony Roma's in Malacca, in Makota Parade now to enjoy the newest Tony Roma's uh, uh, dishes there. And all I have at home is nasi goreng. And we become so dissatisfied. We become so angry, so dissatisfied with life. Why? Because the devil makes you focus on that one thing you cannot have and let you forget the 200, 2,499 things that we have. And that's what this satisfaction does. When we focus, it, when we focus on, this, on, that, on that one thing, we are blurred about everything else. That's how our human minds work, you know. When we are focused on one thing, we, are, we become oblivious to everything else around us. Even though they are there, even though how obvious it is, we are totally oblivious. Let me show you a test. All right, there's a video clip here. Let me just show you a test, how this works. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. That's fine, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Okay, this was an advertisement for road safety. How many of you noticed any of the changes? Anyone? Even one of it? We don't, right? Because we are just so distracted with the one thing, what's, what's happening, what's the plot, what's the question? And we forget everything else. This is how our human mind work. You don't believe me? Let me just show you the picture, okay? Can you see there's 21 changes? Even the inspector's coat has changed colour and we didn't even realise. The dead body is a different person. The, the butler is holding a, a, a rolling pin and a candlestick. The, la the, the, the lady's hat is different. The curtain is different. The pictures at the back are different. Everything has changed in the scene. And we just don't realise. 
And the devil knows this trick. He knows that's how our human minds work. And so, he makes you focus on the one thing you don't have and forget the 2,499 things because he knows that as long as you focus on that one thing, your dissatisfaction in that one thing, everything else doesn't matter. A wife, your husband comes home every day and just leaves the socks on the, on the floor. You don't like it. It irritates you. It dissatisfies you. And you told him, but nothing changed. But you're still dissatisfied about the socks on the floor. Day in, day out, she comes home every day, still socks on the floor. Even though when he comes home and he sits down and spends time talking to you, having a nice conversation to you, with you, all you can think about is the socks is on the floor. When he comes home every day, one day he decides to do something nice to you and cook a lavish dinner for you. And you came home, you see, wow, what a lovely dinner. You sit down, start eating, all you can see are socks on the floor. And then, then one day, when the husband comes home and the children are all noisy and he says, never mind my children, all come, I will take care, give your mother a bit of quiet time. And the father takes care of all the children and the mother was having so quiet, so peaceful, sit down all by herself, watching television, but all her mind can think of, the socks is on the floor. My husband comes home with a huge bouquet of flowers one day and say, Happy birthday, dear. I love you. And as the husband hugged the wife, the wife hugged the husband. All she can see is the socks on the floor. And when that, and all she can focus on is, is that. And then one day, when the husband comes in, when one day is a bad mood, something goes wrong, husband a bit moody, and she, and she sees the socks on the floor and they get in the quarrel and say, Because you leave the socks on the floor, I cannot stand you anymore. I'm going out, I'm walking out of this marriage and you walk out of the marriage. Why? All because of her socks on the floor. But isn't that true? It may sound very ridiculous, but don't we do that many times? Because of one thing that we are dissatisfied about, one small area that we are dissatisfied about, we forget about everything else good that happens. You see, the one, one, problem, one reason is this. Because contentment is a disposition. It's not about your situation. It's a disposition. That's why Paul says in Philippians 4.11, he says, <coughs> I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and know, I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. You see, Paul was writing this when he wrote these words down. He was writing from prison. He was being chained to a Roman guard 24 hours, 7 days a week. And the only food he has at that time, there's no prison food, you know, at that time. The only food he had is if people come and bring food to him. If no one brings food for him, he has no meal for that day. And in the midst of that, he is writing. I can be contented. You see, friends, contentment or satisfaction has nothing to do with the situation. It has nothing to do with whether your husband leaves the socks on the floor, whether your husband picks up the socks on the floor. It doesn't have nothing to do with whether your children behave or misbehave. It has nothing to do with whether your salary is this amount or your salary is that amount. It has nothing to do with whether you have, you have a church that is full of loving members or a church of members who are cold who doesn't care about you. It doesn't matter whether you are sick or you are healthy. It doesn't matter about any of that. Satisfaction is a disposition of the heart. It's nothing to do with your situation. And that's why I'm convinced, I'm, I'm, I've said this before and I'll say it again, and I'm convinced of this, that in life, 90% of your life depends on how you react. 10% depends on what happens to you. 10% is what happens to you, you can't change that. But 90% of your life depends on how you react, your disposition of your heart. But for us, many of us, we live life the other way, right? We live life as though 90% depends on what happens to me, whether it rains or whether it snows, it all depends on that. And I have completely no control over how I react. I have completely no control whether I'm satisfied or discontented, whether I'm angry or irritated or calm, I have no control. And that's meant how many of us live lives. But in reality, friends, 10% is only depends on what happens to you. 90% depends on your reaction. The reality is this, friends. Contentment is about the condition of your hearts. People may be difficult. Things may be bad. But yet, you can be content. So how do we do that in relationships? In relationships, well, in relationships, how does dissatisfaction start in relationships? Which one in the next point of your notes is this. Dissatisfaction starts 
when others don't meet my expectation. When others don't meet my expectations. You know, if I have an expectation of something and they don't meet it, that's when I get dissatisfied. I expect my husband to keep his to pick up his socks. And I expect when I've told him 10 times after that, he will do it. And he doesn't do it, I get dissatisfied. Listen to this parable, Matthew 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. <coughs> now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about a third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And those who came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for, uh, for a denarius? Take what is yours and go away. I will give to the last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Is your eye discontented because I am generous? You see, friends, what happened was this. The landowner went out at 6 a.m. in the morning. He sees a bunch of workers. Come, work for me. I'll pay you one denarius a day. Okay, agreed. Come. Later at 9 a.m., he went out. Still got workers. Come. Later at 11 a, 12 a.m., he went out. There were still workers. Come. And then finally at 3 p.m., he went out. There's still workers. Come. Finally at 5 p.m., when there's only one hour left of working day, he went out and he saw people. And he asked them, Come. When there's only one hour left. And he paid all of them the same. But the, what the first group didn't realize is this. The first group didn't realize that although they had to work the whole day, but yet they were actually jobless people. They had no job. They had no income. They could have gone home that day with zero. They didn't realize that. They didn't realize there was a man kind enough to offer them a job and for a good pay. A denarius was quite a good pay that day. It is a pay for an elite soldier, not for a lousy laborer, you know. It's a good pay. They didn't realize they got what they agreed for. They were never cheated. They were paid what they agreed for. But they became jealous at other people's blessings. Because when they saw other people being blessed, they expected differently. They expected more. They expected what was never theirs. You see, friend, one thing about expectation is this, which we all of us need to realize. Expectation is okay, but when expectation is not the same as entitlement. Expectation is not entitlement. And although we can expect things, we can expect, we expect something, we hope for something to happen. You know, we, it's, it's my target, it's my desire, I want to achieve this, I expect certain things. That is sometimes okay. As long as the expectation is, is, is not so, it's not wrong, if you have right expectation, it's okay. But when your expectations become, I deserve it. He owes me that. I don't have, if you don't give it to me, you are evil, you are rotten, you are cruel, you are unloving. When expectation becomes entitlement, that's when everything goes wrong. That's when dissatisfaction seeps in. That's when problems start. You see, otherwise, expectations will motivate us to move on. It will motivate us to improve, to build our lives. But entitlement, even when a person meets your expectation, you look at him and say, okay lah, that's all. Because I'm entitled to it, ma. 
I'm not, I'm not going to be grateful to you for doing it because I'm entitled to it. When you expect your husband to buy you a present that's worth $500 every birthday, and your husband doesn't, he only buys you a present that's worth $10 every birthday, you get angry and dissatisfied. And but one day when he finally buys you a present that is worth 500 on your birthday, you take it, you look at it, say, in your heart is finally. After all these years, finally you got it right. There's no gratitude. There's no thankfulness. There's no, wow, you finally understood my heart. Oh, I love you so much. Why? Because the expectation has become an entitlement. And when we, are, when we think we're entitled for something, we are not grateful when we get it. Let me ask you, when's the last time you all thank your boss for paying your salary? When's the last time when you receive your salary, you go to boss, oh, thank you very much for giving me this salary. No, I work so hard, I work like this, I should be paid more, but I, I get this salary, I'm happy, I, you know, I deserve the salary. It's entitlement. It's not expectation. And when we make our expectation an entitlement, it sucks the life out of relationship because it breeds dissatisfaction. It allows dissatisfaction to breed. Expectations, we all have expectations. And how disappointed or how satisfied we are in life depends on how, our, how much, what, what our expectations are. Let me give you a quiz. Answer, true or false? Just shout the answer, okay? Number one. Those who work hard will succeed. True or false? True, false, true. Yes? Okay, number two. Evil will be punished. True or false? Good works will be rewarded. Life is just and fair. <laughs> Good. You guys got right expectations. But for the rest of you who were very silent, I know what's going on in your mind. Shouldn't it be true? Don't we teach our children from a young age, you work hard and then you will succeed? Don't we teach our children, hey, you do wrong and you'll be punished? Don't we do that? We tell them, no, no, must be fair. It must always be fair. You get one, your brother will also get one. Must be fair. Life must be fair. We teach them that, right? But when we go through life with this expectation that we think all this is true, friend, you will be very disappointed in life. You are very, very dissatisfied and discontented with life. Because the realities of a fallen world and a sinful world is that all these are not true. And so what do we do? What do we do with our expectations? Which you write your next point of your notes is this. Start with God's truth. Start with God's truth. You see, what forms our expectation of the world and of each other? What forms your expectation of your husband? What forms your expectation of your children, your wife, your parents, your church members? What forms all your expectations? I'll tell you, number one, television. The novels that we read, the movies that we watch, the ideas that we see in other people's families, that we, we, we think is true in other people's families. All this shapes our expectation. But very few or very seldom is it shaped on God's worldview of what life is. Many times we shape our expectation based on comparison. We look at other people and we say, wow, you know, your wife is so nice, so, so obedient, so submissive. I look at my wife, so garang at home. I look at you, wow, oh, your wife, every day you come home, your wife will come and bring tea and massage your shoulder. Wow, so nice. I go home, I have to massage my wife's shoulder. <laughs> and what we do is we compare. When we look at other people's lives and we see how they are and we make that our expectation for our lives. And we're not careful, we make that an entitlement. And when, when we go home and my wife doesn't massage my shoulder, I say, lousy wife, lah, good for nothing wife, doesn't massage my shoulder. And we allow dissatisfaction to come in. But friends, we should never allow anything, we should never expect anything from those around us that is not according to the truth of God. For example, let me ask you this question. What do you expect from a friend? <coughs> friends, 
You know, those you go yamcha with, those you go outing with, friends. What do you expect from them? To be kind? To be there for you? To encourage you? When you are, when you are weak, to be there to pick you up? Is that what you expect, ex, ex, expect from friends? What does the Bible say about friends that you should expect? Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. In other words, what the Bible is saying is what you should expect from a friend is that they will sharpen you. How? By sharpening you, by cutting you. As an iron sharpens iron. Expectations, friends. You need your expectations of your wife to be in line, in line with God's truth. Your expectations of your husband, your children, your family, all this has to be in line with God's truth. And even so, even after they are in line with God's truth, it's not enough because they will fail you. In fact, we should write the next point of your notes is this. Start with God's truth and give them room for failure. Give room for failure. You see, the problem with society today is this. We don't give room for failure. In relationships, we give very little room for failure. You know, when I was in the manufacturing industry last time, we always have what we call margin of error. A margin of error. In everything we do, you know, we, we are taught to anticipate errors. So we are taught to anticipate a production line. We'll say, okay, this will go wrong, that will go wrong, the operator can make this mistake, this mistake can happen. And so our motto or our life uh, expectation in the production line is always this. Any, what can go wrong will go wrong. Whatever that can go wrong, will go wrong. And so we work towards looking at anything that can go wrong and making sure that it doesn't go wrong. But although we put so much energy and effort to make sure that what can go wrong will not go wrong, yet we will always still say there are things that will go wrong that we can't predict. Things that will go wrong that we can't prevent in advance. And so what we do is we always have a margin of error. And we must always have that. If a customer orders a thousand pieces, we will say, okay, a thousand pieces. But knowing these people in the production line, knowing our process, we are going to have 5% rejects. And so we'll build in a margin of error. That even though although he ordered a thousand pieces, we will have to build a thousand plus 5%. Otherwise, there, will be, there is no margin of error. And we always work with a margin of error. And the more unreliable things are, the bigger our margin of error is. Same thing goes in relationship. Although we have God's truth for them, we know what life should be. We know according to God's word, according to God's expectation, what things should be, we know what it should be. But yet, we need to have a margin of error with one another. We need to give people margins of error. Otherwise, when they fail, and they will, they will, and when they fail, if we have no margin of error, will explode. You know, it's like this, you know, it's like you are being pushed against a wall. A wall of thorns, you know, like those spike walls. And if your relationships are like this, if you have no margin of error, the moment the person fails you or hurts you, it pushes you back, you, you get spiked by the wall, you get hit and you get angry and you lash out. But if you have a huge margin of error between you and that spike wall. And when you are in relationships with people, and pop, something happens. Your husband promised you something, but he never fulfilled it. Something happened, poop, you get bounced back. But it's okay, I'm not hurt. Why? Because I have a margin of error. And as I continue in my relationship again, I get hit back again. It's okay, there's a margin of error. When I try again, poop, it's okay, because there's a margin of error problem for us today is we don't give enough room for failure. Husbands, you expect your wives to love you, to be kind to you, to massage your shoulder, bring you tea, massage your feet. It's okay. But when she doesn't do it, it's also okay. Because I have a huge margin of error. Wives, you expect your husband to never hurt you, to never say a wrong thing, to never say something that will hurt you and make you cry? Yeah, it's good to expect that. But if it does happen, 
It's okay. Because I have a huge margin of error. It doesn't mean that I harden my heart. It doesn't mean that, you know, to have a margin of error means I harden my heart that, you know, I don't care, lah, whatever you do, pop. I'm, I'm, no, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that I have a heart that never trusts people, that never loves people, no. I still trust them. I still love them. I still work with them. But when they fail me, when they disappoint me, when they betray me, when they hurt me, it's okay because I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I have margin, I have room in my heart for that failure, for that hurts, for that, for, that, for that betrayal, for that disappointment. And because I have margin in my heart, margin for error. That's why Isaiah 2.22 says this, don't put your trust in mere humans. They are as frail as breath. What good are they? In other words, what the Bible is saying is, yeah, you love people, sometimes you trust them, you hope the best for them, but be prepared, they will fail you. Humans will fail. And that is a truth of life. And the sooner we get it right in our heart, the sooner we realize it, and the sooner we factor that in in our relationships, it's okay. And so I can go through relationships and people will say nasty things about me sometimes, you know, people say nasty things about pastors, maybe more than other people. But I'm okay. I'm okay because I, 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 I understand. I understand people. I, can, I trust people. I depend on them to do things for me, for the church, for the betterment of the kingdom of God. And many times, sometimes they fail. Sometimes they do a worse job. Or sometimes they just say, I give up. It's okay. Because I know. They have their errors, there are rooms, there are margins for errors. <clears throat> but you see, friends, although we need to give people margin for error, it will probably protect us from being hurt and dissatisfied, but it ain't going to build satisfaction. It ain't going to build contentment. To do that, the second thing we need to do, if you write in your notes there, is cultivate thankfulness in all things. Cultivate thankfulness in all things. You know, we live in a world today that is not so full of thankfulness anymore. We live in a world that has lost gratitude, you know. We, gratitude is no longer a, a, a part of our nature or part of our psyche anymore. When's the last time you look around and you thank God for the flowers and the fresh air or the rain this morning? How many of you actually woke up and say, wow, Lord, Wonderful, thank you rain for falling down and cooling the weather and giving me such a nice morning this today. Any of you thank God for the rain? We don't. We no longer build a heart of gratitude. It's like First Thessalonians says this, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, the Bible has always talked about being, grat being grateful. <clears throat> There's a Dr. Robert Emmons psychology professor in University of California made an experiment. He got about 300 groups of people together and he divided them into three groups and he gave them all journals, diaries to write. The first group, every day, they must write at least a few things that they should be thankful for. Thankful for the flower, thankful for the food, thankful for a nice meal, whatever. Another group, is to, told to write things that they are unhappy about. Oh, I'm unhappy because my wife came down five minutes late uh, doing her makeup. I'm angry because the car couldn't start well. And another group was just to write, write anything that comes to your mind. Whatever that pops in your mind, you just write it. So this group went to live their life. After about a month, he gathered them all back. And he discovered that those who wrote anything and those who wrote all the unhappy things in life, they were just so-so. They, they were the same, no difference in their life. They were unhappy, they were still unhappy. They were grumpy, they were still grumpy. They were dissatisfied, they were still dissatisfied. But the group, they went back and for one whole month wrote only things that made them happy, things that they were thankful about. When they came back, there was a 25% improvement in their level of happiness and satisfaction in life. It took Dr. Robert Emmons 10 years of experiment and studies to discover this, to discover what the Bible 
already teaches. That is to have a heart of gratitude. Because when we have a heart of gratitude, when we, are, when we cultivate gratitude for all things, we are now, what we are doing is we are, do, we are working against the tactic of the enemy. Rather than focusing on that one tree that we cannot have, we are now taking our minds off that one tree and we are focusing on the 2,499 trees that we do have. And when we do that, friends, it keeps our eyes off that one tree and life becomes so much better. So where do we start? Friends, last point in your notes, start with relationships. Start by being thankful for the people around you, for the relationships you have, for the relationships that God has given you. Husbands, when's the last time you said thank you to your wife? I mean, honestly, seriously, when was the last time you went up to your wife and said, you know, dear, I thank you for loving me. I thank you that you chose to marry me 20 years ago. I thank you for staying with me all this while. I thank you for always being home when I come home. I thank you for loving my children. Husbands, when's the last time you thank your wives? <coughs> wives, when's the last time you thank your husband? When's the last time you thank your children for being your children? When's the last time you thank a fellow church member for being here with you? When's the last time you thank the people who greets you in the morning? The people who help usher you, usher you people who uh, you know, do whatever it does to make, make, your, make your visit here so comfortable? When's the last time you say thank you to the people around you? But what about difficult people, uh, Pastor? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.4, Paul says this, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. He was writing to the church in Corinthians and he says, I thank my God for the grace of God for all of you. Do you know that a bunch of Corinthians were a bunch of people who were criticizing Paul? There were people in their midst who were accusing Paul of not being a true apostle. There were people in the midst who were saying that Paul uh, was not a real apostle, he's a false teacher. There were people in their midst that says, no, we follow other people, we are not going to follow Paul. In the midst of all these people, Paul says, I thank God for all of you, for the grace of God in you. <coughs> Same thing even for the difficult people in our lives. Thank God for God's grace in their life, for what God is doing in their life, for what God is blessing in their life. Give thanks to God. Cultivate a heart of gratitude for the lives around you. And when you start doing that, friends, I guarantee you, relationships will become better. You know, we have a saying in English, right? The grass is always greener on the other side. The cars are greener, the wives are greener, the children are greener, everything is greener on the other side. That's not true. You know what is true? It is greener where you water it. Where you water it, that's where it is greener. If you're watering where you're standing, it's greener. If you're watering your neighbor's plants, then that will be greener. And how do you water them? With a spirit of thankfulness with a spirit of gratitude. Every time you're just thankful for the relationships, you're thankful for the people, you're thankful for your love, you're thankful for them, and you share it, and you show it, you're watering the grass on your side. And it becomes greener. So this week, in closing, I have a homework for all of you. Assignment. DG leaders, make sure you check your members do assignment or not. In this week, for the next seven days, every day, I want you to be thankful for someone. And I want you to thank that person. Go up to that person and just be grateful for the person. Just thank him for the next seven days. Even if you, you want to thank your wife for the next seven days, fine. Go and thank her every day for the next seven days. Just thank someone. Thank a relationship. And I guarantee you, your relationships will get much better 
as you cultivate that heart of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus. <coughs> Wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord, this morning, once again, we ask for your spirit to come and fill our hearts, Lord. Speak to us again, Lord. Your word. And Lord, may you search our hearts. If there be hearts of dissatisfaction in us, of discontentment in us, Lord, may you teach us not to make it, to, to teach us to search our hearts and remove all entitlements and wrong expectations from our hearts and give us a heart that has a huge margin of error, a heart that has so much room for the people around us, for so much room for failure. And help us, Lord, to cultivate thankfulness for the people around us, for the relationships around us every day of our lives. Lord, I just commit each and every one of them to your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.